Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church Online. We're glad you could join us this morning. Let's just start our service with some worship to our Father. Great is the Lord. us to be able to come here, for allowing us, Father, to be able to worship you in your house and to be able to make this work in these troubling times. So thank you, Father. We praise you, Lord. We know that above all, we need you, Lord. We can't, we can't do anything without you, Lord. And I just ask, Lord, that you would make this our prayer and hear our hearts this morning as we worship you.
Michigan, as around 300 protesters, some of them armed, convert people waiting in line for hours. This is a crisis, a pandemic, an epidemic, or whatever you want to call it. Tonight, anger in the streets across America, massive crowds gathering again. Now surpassing 4 million, the total doubling in only six weeks. In New York, a city still on lockdown. Many are making their voices heard despite the risks of the pandemic. In Florida, where cases are surging. You can see the smoke continuing to billow as many, many buildings are on fire. Are, quote, increasing the strain on the health care system. And so that city burn. We live in a society that still sees new COVID concerns as protests in the middle of the pandemic. The shattered glass from a night of rage. Across the country, an ominous pattern. A potential breakthrough in COVID tracking. This California reports its highest number of virus deaths in one day. All that has just been either broken into or burned to the ground. This day, California filled with Dr. protesters. Dr. Anthony Fauci's and technology technology leaders this scene another land land over city. Life. Well, good day, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, whenever you're watching this. Uh, we're just glad you're here. And we are continuing today with part six of our Wise Up series, Understanding Radical Wisdom for Radical Times, because there's no denying that we are living 
maybe in the most radical times this nation has seen, certainly in our lifetimes. And we need radical wisdom to know how to respond to it and how to follow through with it. And, the, and maybe the first question to be asked is, what is wisdom? And according to the dictionary, wisdom is an expertise. In other words, being good at dealing with the difficult issues of life. And we have plenty of difficult issues these days. And so we all need wisdom. We want to deal with them with an expertise in a, in a healthy way. And of course, wisdom is available because I've been putting this verse up every week and it's a good one to memorize. As James 1.5 says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and He'll give it to you. That's a great promise. When we're in doubt about these things, when we're not sure what to think of, of protests or riots or politics or politicians or a virus, when we're not sure what to think, ask for wisdom and God will give it to you. Now, not everyone does that. So we've been having this little segment here called, What Were You Thinking of People Who Do Not <laughs> Make the Wisest Decision? And so someone sent me on Facebook, Alan Terry sent me a little uh, picture this week, and he sent a picture and he said, wise or not wise? Well, here's the picture. Let's go to full screen on that for a second. Wise or not wise? Putting your foot in a wood chipper to get a jam out of there. I would definitely say that is the not wise category. So, let me ask, have you ever done something really stupid? Yes, I have. I could tell you stories. Some of them I would not want to tell you, but, uh, but we've all done that. We've all done things. Oh, I can't believe I survived that. But here's another side of it. Have you ever said something really stupid? And I think all of us have. You know, something that you wish you hadn't have said. Something that you step back and, and said to yourself, what was I thinking? What was I thinking when I said that? And we've all done that. And honestly, you probably weren't thinking at all. That's, that's how that usually happens. I, you know, I have said things that I instantly regretted. And I'll bet you have too. Things that were you know, insulting to someone or thoughtless, and you didn't intend it to be that way, but that's how it came out. Or, or you let something slip that was supposed to be confidential, something someone had trusted you with. It's in the vault, and the vault's not very secure. And you regret what you said. Or you snapped out in an instant of an emotion and said something mean or cruel to someone. I think we've all done that. Maybe you said the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time. Kind of like this. Great party. Yeah, I don't know about Tiffany wearing a white dress, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Why shouldn't my daughter be wearing white? Need a moment? Try the chocolate caramel and fresh cookie crunch of Twix. I bet you have said some things that a candy bar will not fix. And frankly, there are so many things being said these days that nothing will fix. You know, vicious and hostile words are flying like bullets in, in this extremely divided time in our nation, an extremely divided political season. And the damage is intense, and it may well get worse because, you know, we've seen it this week. Some protesters are, are armed, and it's only going to be a matter of time unless something changes before full-out firefights are happening in our streets. And, and we know that because there's people hoping for this and driving that direction. I think it's a revolution that people are wanting. And it's violent words that stir it up. And it's not just on the political scene. It's not just in the streets, but it's words that are spoken in haste that cause damage in our own homes and in our families and in our friendships, our relationships, our, our workplaces. Uh, you have been hurt by words. We all have. Even words from people that love you and people that you love, and, and yet you have said hurtful words to them. They've said them to you. And it's, it's damaging. Psychologists and therapists are always dealing with the emotional damage from words that are said while we're young. 
You're no good. You'll never amount to anything. A friend of mine talked about uh, when he was probably eight or ten and went to a parent-teacher conference, I guess, with his mom and things had not gone well in that class and coming out, she said, I'm so disappointed in you. And that just crushed him for many, many years. Words can hurt. And in those situations, we carry some of those words throughout our lives and they affect us every single day and they affect all our other relationships and they are such a heavy burden. And it's why God warns us about watching our words. And God has been warning about these things for forever. Goes all the way back early in the Bible. And as believers, we need to learn how to step away from this swirling internal chaos that words have produced in us. And we need to step away from the chaos that the words of the world produce throughout society. We have to make sure that the words we speak are born from wisdom and carry wisdom. We need to learn the wisdom of choosing our words wisely. The wisdom of choosing our words wisely. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your guidance for us. We thank you that you know all those things that are in us and you know the feelings that have been produced by hurtful words and even the feelings that are produced by the hurtful words we say and the regret and things that we deal with. So, Lord, we pray as we work through this that you help us to understand how to choose our words wisely. Amen. Words have so much power. You know, in, in the book of James, James is Jesus' brother, remember, who became a believer after he saw his brother executed and then come back to life. And James writes this in, in his letter in the Bible, the book of James. This is in James chapter 3, and I'll be highlighting a couple of parts of this. But he starts off with this. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. That almost seems out of place as he's talking about words, but words are the tools of a teacher. And for those who teach in the church, they are a critical element. You have to choose your words wisely when you are teaching the things of God. And so James gives a stern reminder that God expects more of teachers and leaders who use words from a position of power. And don't miss uh, the word judged that James has in here. He says, we will be judged more strictly. Teachers will be judged more strictly. And then he goes on, he says, indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. If we could control our tongues. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. And he says, in the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. I love the analogies in here, the metaphors. Because you think of a, a horse, an animal that weighs 1,000 pounds, 1,500 pounds. And a child can control that animal with a little bit in its mouth. And think of a, a rudder that can make a huge ship turn. A small thing can have huge implications. And the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. Oh, it talks big. But, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Now, I can't look at this without it bringing to mind something that is a problem in churches. It's a problem throughout society, but it's a problem in churches. And that is when that tongue starts talking about things may or may not be true, but things that fall into the category of gossip. You know, there is a, that's one of the most damaging things you can have in a church, gossip, because people start saying things and, and other people believe them. It may not even be true. That little spark can set a great forest on fire. 
And James continues with this. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It's not just a little spark. It's blazing. It is a whole world of wickedness. And it will corrupt your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Those are some tough words that James is giving us. Tongue is a small thing, man, but a little spark will burn down a forest and your tongue is already on fire. It's a world of wickedness. It's set on fire by hell itself. That's tough stuff, James. And then he goes on and says, you know, people can tame all kinds of animals, you know, birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It's restless and evil and full of deadly poison. And some of you know this. We don't like to think about this, but some of you were so hurt by words when you were young, and it's still that poison is in you. And James says, sometimes that tongue praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this isn't right. Shouldn't be that way. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or grapevine produce figs? No. And you cannot draw fresh water from a salty spring. See, when blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth, we have a problem. We have a serious problem. And the point that he's making is that what comes out of your mouth flows from what is inside. It defines who you are. Because Jesus also used this metaphor of fruit growing on trees, just like James did, fig produce olives or grapevine producing figs. Jesus used that same analogy, and this is probably where James got the idea. Jesus in Matthew 12 says this, A tree is identified by its fruit. That's how you know what kind of tree it is. You may not be a botanist, and you may not know what apple leaves look like. You may not know what pear leaves look like. But when you walk up to the tree and you see it's got apples, that's a pretty good indication of what kind of tree it was. And so Jesus said the tree is identified by its fruit. If the tree is good, the fruit will be good. But if the tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. And then, oh, you think of Jesus as being the kind and gentle Jesus. Yeah. And then Jesus turns to this group of religious leaders that he's talking to, and he says, you brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? And the key phrase, whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And so here's the question we need to ask ourselves. What comes out of your mouth? What comes out of your mouth? Because that's what's in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then Jesus says this line, which is kind of terrifying. Verse 36 of the same passage, Jesus says, and I tell you this, you're going to have to give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. You know, sometimes we're just shooting the breeze or whatever it is, you know, we're just talking about this and talking about that and, and they're idle words. And in the midst of that, Jesus brings up judgment day. You know, James speaks of judgment too in that passage. You shouldn't be teachers. You're going to be judged more severely. Teachers will be judged more strictly. And when James does that, he's just quoting his brother, Jesus who brings the subject up right in the middle of talking about what comes out of our mouths. Idle words. What that word, the Greek word behind that means, without work. Words that are not at work, that are not accomplishing anything. They're idle. They're inactive. And, and it has the idea that they choose to be idle and inactive. Insincere, false, unprofitable. And it makes me think of of uh, Well, they used to have bumper stickers. They don't have bumper stickers so much anymore, but they have memes all over Facebook, and here's one that I've always loved. Caution, be sure brain is engaged before putting mouth into gear. It's a common concept because we do it. The Bible warns about it. And then Jesus goes on to say, as here's that last thing, you called to give an account for every idle word you say in verse 37. 
the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Words are a big deal. We have to choose our words wisely. Our words reveal who we are. If you speak poisonous words, realize that that they are bubbling up from poison in your soul. It's not a pleasant thought, but it's truth. And we try to excuse it. We know it makes us uncomfortable. Well, you know, I wouldn't have said that, but it was only because I had a tough day. It was only because I was hungry. It was only because my knees hurt or whatever it is. And we say that we excuse these things that come out of our mouths when in reality, they're just revealing what's in us. When darkness comes out of your mouth, and when darkness comes out of my mouth, it just shows how much darkness is still inside is we say things without thinking about it, without choosing our words. But Jesus says you are going to give an account for every idle word. And that makes me think sometimes. Does that mean the more we talk, the more at risk we are? (laughs) Could be, you know. And so we've been basing this series largely in the wisdom literature of the Bible, which is the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes. And here's a verse from Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 5. Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2, that says this. As you enter the house of God, keep your ears open and your mouth shut. That's pretty good advice. Keep your ears open and your mouth shut. It is evil to make mindless offerings to God. Don't make rash promises. Don't be hasty in bringing matters before God. After all, God is in heaven. You're here on earth, so let your words be few. It's pretty straight ahead. James kind of comes up with the same concept. James 1.19 says this, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. And I want you to notice something. This is the exact opposite of what's happening in these radical times that we live in. People are slow to listen, they're quick to speak, and they're angry before anything even happens. But you must be quick to listen. Slow down, listen to what someone is saying to you. Don't be in a hurry to respond. Don't get angry. And it brings peace to situations. And James says this only a couple of sentences after his instruction about asking God for wisdom. So ask for wisdom, and then... Part of that wisdom is this, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. That's a part of gaining wisdom right there. So we've been looking at the book of Proverbs and and the Bible literature, uh, wisdom literature in general. And I just want to hit a few verses through here that just summarize these concepts. It tells us this over and over and over again in different wording and different, coming from a different direction, different examples, trying to Drill it in so we get it. Proverbs 10, 19. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> Too much talk leads to sin. Reminds me of another saying that I've heard. I don't, I've heard this attributed to different people. This, uh, this slide attributes it to Mark Twain. It is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. (laughs) Be silent. Let people think. Because if you say something, you might say something pretty stupid. Don't feel like you have to talk. Now, sometimes Christians think that controlling the tongue mainly means that there are certain words you shouldn't say. shouldn't say those words. Those are bad words. Back in my day, it was the seven words you couldn't say on TV. The comedian George Carlin came up with that and had a routine about it, a comedy routine. But i got to tell you something. People get worked up about this, but it is so interesting to me that, that Scripture does not give us a list of bad words. It doesn't give a list of words that you shouldn't say. Well, it can't because those words change constantly. They've changed in my lifetime. They're different across cultures. They're different across time frames. And the issue is not what the words are. The issue is the motivation and the intent that brings them out. I mean, you know, a lot of people think it's the F-bomb is really the mother of all bad words, I think. 
it was described in the Christmas story. But that's not even a bad word in itself. I got to tell you, some years ago, I was in Lowe's. And I was in the tool section, and I'm looking for something. And this guy came up and asked me a question. And he was, he was a kind of a biker-looking guy, probably in his 50s. And he's asking me about some little tool or a drill bit or something. And somebody had sent him in there to get it. And he's asking me, I don't know why they send me in to get the bleeping thing, because I don't know anything about bleeping stuff like that. And I'm supposed to, I don't even know which bleeping owl to be in. And he's just going on and on. And he's dropping the F-bomb about three times in a sentence. And my first thought is, dude, you know, lighten up a little bit. And then it just got so ridiculous that it wasn't offensive. It was funny. <laughs> I'm standing there trying not to laugh at this guy, because his... I don't know, his language was so limited or something, but, but it, the word had no power. It's not the word, it's the motivation and the intent. You know, because sometimes people are offended by words that I consider totally innocent. You know, uh, at one point when Julie was teaching school, she had a parent complain because she had used the word butt, you know, B-U-T-T, -T, like your butt. And the, the mom didn't like that because in their family they said the word bottom. You know, and yet most people would say, consider that completely inoffensive. So how do you know what these bad words are? Because they're different in different places. There can be no list of bad words. It just doesn't work. But here's what the Bible does say. This is what the Apostle Paul writes. You remember, Paul is the guy who just in the few years after Jesus' life was going around starting churches all over the known world. And then he would write letters to these churches, and we have those letters. And this is from a letter he wrote to the church in the town of Ephesus. Ephesians 4.29, and Paul says this, don't use foul or abusive language. He doesn't define it. He says, let everything you say be good and faithful. So he doesn't define any bad words, but he gives the opposite. He tells you what good words are. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. That's the goal. Not avoiding these bad words. The goal is making sure, this is actually a harder challenge. The goal is making sure that what you say is going to be an encouragement to those who hear you. Bad words are those that are abusive. They're not helpful. They're not an encouragement. And, and the fact is, you can say words like that all day long without ever cussing, you know, seven words that can't be said on TV. You can say abusive and non-helpful and, and discouraging words without ever cussing. Still, Christians should be careful of the words they use. And not because the words are bad, but because they're offensive to many people. Speaking them is not a sin against God, it's a sin against love. Because when you offend others, that is, when you offend others needlessly, that is a sin against love. And of course, that is a sin against God. To choose to offend someone is not a loving attitude, you know. I mean, this is a common topic today because um, these words are not evil, they're just rude. There's a difference. Foul language. Paul uses that, foul language. So look that up. And what the Greek word means, it has to do with rotting material, rotting plant matter, rotting flesh. It means bad, rotten, putrid, malevolent. There's that evil intent. Shameful, filthy, without honor, and unholy. That's foul language. The antonyms, the opposite of that is good, benevolent, sincere, gracious, kind. That's the language we should be speaking. And Paul continues in the same passage. He says, obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes, these are not for you. So watch your jokes. Be careful with that. Obscene stories, foolish talk. We are to avoid those things. And then Paul again states, here's what to avoid, but here's what to pursue. And he goes on, instead of these things, instead of obscene stories, instead of foolish talk and coarse jokes, instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Don't just get rid of this. Bring this in. Let thankfulness to God shape your conversation and your words. Choose your words wisely. Now, this whole word choose imp implies something. If you, 
If, imagine you're looking at an assortment of items, you know, a, I think of Lowe's and looking last night for, okay, I need a blah, 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 and you're looking you to choose the right thing. Or when you go to the grocery store and you're looking at produce, and I remember seeing my mom when I was a kid, she'd take an ear of corn, peel it back a little bit to inspect it, and then she makes the choice. You look for the good ones, you inspect them, and this is the same way with words. You look for the good words, you inspect them, and you choose the good ones, the ones that people will enjoy, the ones that people will benefit from, the ones that are encouraging. And you use your words to encourage and to build up and to advise. And sometimes even to warn. Warning is an appropriate use of words. The Bible is full of warnings. This message is a warning about how we use our words. Sometimes we need to warn people about foolish and dangerous things. I think it's appropriate in the radical times that we live in. Warn people. There are many dangerous and foolish things going on all around us. And there's foolish ideas and there's foolish actions and dangerous things. And here's some wisdom from the book of Proverbs on this. Proverbs 10.21 says this, the words of the godly encourage people. That's not what's happening in society. But fools, on the other hand, they're destroyed by their own lack of common sense. You know, warnings are appropriate. But there's a fine line between words of warning and words of hate. And fools, according to this verse, they're not destroyed by your meme on Facebook. They destroy themselves through a lack of common sense. Oh, but the words of the godly, that might make a difference. They can encourage many. You know, it is fair to say, watch out for this or watch out for that. It's fair to say there is no excuse for looting, burning, and riots. But you cross the line when you speak to people or about people saying they're idiots or evil. That's a different thing. Let me share this. Jesus speaking. This is in Matthew 5. And Jesus said, You have heard that our ancestors were told, You must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. We get that. That makes sense. But I say, if you're even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Your words matter. When we allow ourselves to get so angry and so disgusted with people, it brings out the poison that's in us. And it does no good whatsoever. You are not going to change a man's mind by calling him an idiot. And yet you see so much of that. And we can't forget this in these radical times. Here's some wisdom. Paul, again, writing to the church in Ephesus, reminds them, says this, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Oh, that's hard to keep in mind because we see these things going on and we see these people on TV, they're saying this and they're saying that and, 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 and we think that's our enemy. Paul says, no, no, it's not it at all. You're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. You are fighting against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world. This picture is bigger than you think it is. You're fighting against mighty powers in this dark world. You're fighting against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, in these radical times, we have to remember who the enemy really is. Evil rulers, authorities of the unseen world. And when we use poorly chosen words, it just plays into what these evil powers are trying to do. <laughs> You're not going to change their mind by reposting some meme that came across your Facebook feed. You know, you know, you get those things through and say, yeah, that's right, that's a good one. Share, Let's show those stupid people on the other side. Shared my timeline. You're not doing anything. You know, and, and that meme, that counts as your words too. As soon as you share it, make sure you choose them wisely. Because the voice of conflict is ringing out all around us. Aren't you tired of it? You can be different. You, can be, you are called to be different. Proverbs 16.21 says this, the wise are known for their understanding. That's why people know. The, the, the wise are known for their understanding. Pleasant words are persuasive. 
You want to make a difference? You want to, you want to change perspectives? You want to change people's minds? The wise are known for understanding. Pleasant words are persuasive. So use wisdom in choosing the words you speak. Use wisdom in choosing the words you speak. And use wisdom in choosing the words you hear. You know what? It can make a big difference in life to avoid words that tear you down. To intentionally avoid words that complicate, you know. And I, I'm just saying the media, what's going on in the media these days, the TV, internet, social media, that stuff is full of poisonous words. And I talk to people who are stepping away from it, and it's like, that's wisdom. Maybe you need to stop letting evil words and evil ideas flood your brain. Because that's poison. You know, what are you watching on TV, on Netflix, on Prime? Does it build your relationship with God? Or does it nudge you into the enemy camp, little by little, to the point where you almost don't notice that your attitudes are changing, your perspective is changing? Those words are not with, worth listening to, but here are some words that are worth listening to. Jesus speaking about words. This is in Luke 21. Jesus said, you know what? In the big picture, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. My words will never disappear. And he goes into a little bit more detail in a passage in John. I want to set this up a little bit. Uh, Jesus had said some very difficult words to a large group that was following him, and they didn't understand. It didn't make sense to him. It wasn't appealing to him. It wasn't what they wanted to hear. And so they started walking away. And so John 6, 61, Jesus was aware that his disciples, now this isn't the 12, that his apostles, these were the larger crowd of disciples. Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? You think, this is tough. Wait till you see me ascend to heaven again. The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus says, my words. They will never disappear because they are spirit and they are life. And then he goes on. But some of you don't believe me. Okay, a parenthetical statement here says, For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. But then he said, That is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. And here's what happened. Many at this point, verse 66, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. They'd had enough, a little bit of a challenge. And they turned and walked off. And suddenly, it's just Jesus and the 12 with this crowd walking away. And Jesus turns at the 12 and says, are you also going to leave? You guys leaving too? And Simon Peter replies with this. Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. He says, we believe and we know that you're the Holy One of God. So the point is, these are the words that we need to fill ourselves with. The words that give eternal life. God's words. Choose the words that you hear wisely. And that will impact the words that you speak. And in Psalm 119, it encapsulates the attitude that we should have towards God's words. How sweet your words taste to me. They're sweeter than honey. Oh, they're wonderful, they're glorious, they're appealing, they're attractive, they're powerful. Jesus alone has the words of eternal life. So listen to him. Choose his words. Follow him. Commit your life to him. You know, that's the most radical wisdom that there is for radical times, for all times, is to commit your life 
to Jesus. So wise up. Call on his name today. Offer your life to God. And you can have that wisdom. And he'll make the changes in your life that you've never been able to make. He'll help tame your tongue. But it's a process of us yielding to him and allowing him to have that effect on our lives, of choosing to follow Christ, to live as he would have us to live. It's a choice we make. And it's the beginning of choosing wisely. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your words your holy, your righteous words, that you've recorded them, that you've given, to, uh, given us to them all these centuries from the time they were originally written. Lord, help us to incorporate your holy words into our lives and your holy will into our lives. Help us to yield to you, to follow you, to allow you to cleanse us and make us like Jesus. That's your promise. And to bring us into your kingdom. And we thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to encourage you to stick around for a couple of minutes. We have another song. And then there's a very important announcement. And so just enjoy this last song. As a matter of fact, stand, get off your couch. Stand up. Sing this song with us. It's about your soul being on fire. So, And then stick around for an important message about uh, what our plans are in coming weeks. Thanks for being here. See you soon. Okay, one, two, three, four. God, I'm running for your heart. I'm running for your heart. Till I am a soul.
Well, thank you for sticking around. We just want to give you an update on what's happening as far as reopening the church. Uh, we have been, oh, we had a long discussion with the elders on this, how the different things that factor into it, what our motivations are for why this is happening. And at the end of the long discussion, we decided to go ahead and open the church on September 6th, which is next week. Now, I want to give you some background on this and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. You know, we talked about many things and, you know, observing what other churches are doing. John MacArthur Grace Community Church has been going back and forth with L.A. County because they're meeting indoors. They're having normal church services. And, and uh, even though the, the, it's not a law, it's a statement that they're not allowed to do that. But they're doing it because they thought it was more important to meet than to be worried about that. And they've gone back and forth with the county. The last ruling on this was a, a L.A. court gave them permission to meet. They said there is no court order prohibiting them. So their meeting is normal. Other churches have been threatened with fines and lawsuits and even arrests uh, because they're meeting without local government policies uh, in place. And we considered all of that. And we decided we need to open. And here's why. You know, for some people that they're are struggling with this, it's a political decision. Government's not going to tell us what to do. We have First Amendment rights, which is all true. But I don't think that's our best motivation. Our motivation is not to take political stands as the church. Our decision to open is based on the needs and the desires of our people. We just feel it's been harmful to our congregation to have gone so long without some level of connection. It is the definition of the church that we gather together, that we assemble, that we meet together. It is the biblical definition of who we are. And to have that be denied is having an impact on many of our people. Uh, and, and not just here, but throughout the country and, and not just in churches, but suicide rates are up, addictions are up, all kinds of things because people need to be together. And so we have based our decision on that. But before we get into a little more details, it's interesting how we as an American public think about this. I want to show you some charts. And uh, the first one is based on this. Well, September 6th is the day we're planning on open. But now here's an interesting question. I'm going to give you a chance to think about this for a minute. A poll asked Americans how many people in the country have had COVID-19, first question, Second question, or died from it. So I'm going to give you a second on that. And this is from a few weeks ago. But a few weeks ago, what would you say, Americans in general, how many people do they think have had COVID as a percentage of the population? And how many have died from it as a percentage of the population? I'll give you a second. Do, 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 do. Okay, that's long enough. Here's the answers of the actual results of this poll. Their answer as of a few weeks ago is that they think 20% of Americans uh, have had it. Those dots that you see represent 100,000 people, so it's a percentage. That 20% have had it and 9% of Americans have died from it. That is the public perception of where we are. Now here's the truth. So 20%, 9%. Here's the truth. 1% of Americans have had it, and 0.04% of Americans have died from it. But some people feel that with all this going on, that we are um, seeing uh, something that's actually being far worse than it is. So I went ahead and ran some more uh, polls through this, or just this isn't polls. This is just numbers I got off government websites of where we actually are in the United States in San Bernardino County right now. In the United States, as of yesterday, 1.79, so 1.8% of Americans have been diagnosed with COVID. And you can see that little orange slice there is the number that have had it, and that big blue circle is those who have not had it. The U.S. COVID death rate is 0.05%. That little white line is the smallest line that Microsoft Excel can make. This is not a disease that is ripping through the country. 0.05 have died from this. That's the United States. 
Let's take a look at the county of San Bernardino. Numbers again from last night. The number of diagnosed cases in San Bernardino County is at 2.16%. And you see the orange of those who have been diagnosed as positive and the blue area of those who have uh, not had it. And then on the other side of that is the county death rates, which is 0 0.003. Again, the smallest line that Microsoft Excel can make. It's not 20% that have had it. It's not 9% that have died from it. It is a very small number of people just in reality. And how about Hellendale? So here's the numbers from Hellendale from San Bernardino website. The percentage of people who have had, have been diagnosed with COVID is 0.75%. So three quarters of one person out of uh, Hellendale as a percentage. And in Hellendale, reportedly one person has died. We don't know who that is. I haven't heard who it is. Um, but that number can't be drawn on a chart either. Uh, the level of risk that we're actually facing is much smaller than many people think it is. And that factors into our decision. Now, we are concerned about a number of things. The virus is real. There are patients at St. Mary's. There are people that have died at St. Mary's. So it's not like we're just blowing this off. This is a real threat. Uh, and we don't want to take it too lightly, but we want to take it realistically. Also, we are concerned about our witness to the community. What are we representing to the community? And I think one of the things we need to represent is how seriously we take our faith, that this matters to us, that it is important for us to be gathering together as the Bible tells us to. Uh, and like I say, the virus is real, but it's a calculated risk. And everything we do is a calculated risk. Risk cannot be eliminated in life. It just can't. I mean, there is a, a risk to driving. And you go up and down national trails and heading into town, it seems like every mile there's a memorial cross on the road. Because there is a real risk to driving down that road. And yet we do it. Because we believe the benefit is higher than the risk. You know, you... you you go to Costco and you buy lettuce, and it could have E. coli. It's a small risk, but it's a risk, and people die from that. If you, you could dine out and get food poisoning. Yeah, here's a good one. You go into surgery. I had surgery on my ankle a couple years ago, and you go in, and they're, they're going through the procedure, and they tell you at that point, even though it has, it's just my ankle, that you could die from this. You could have a reaction to the anesthesia. You could have any number of things that could go wrong, and you go in for the surgery, and you could die from that. But we go in for surgery all the time. Most of us have been in for surgery because it's a calculated risk. You could fall in your house and die, and I can think of two people in this church that that's happened to over the past six or eight years. Life is risky. But looking at those actual numbers and the charts, we have to make a calculated risk in everything we do. Now, different responses are going to be different in different communities because there's different levels of infection. If you were in some of the areas that are having a major outbreak, it would affect how we're thinking and what we're doing. But our infection rate in Hellendale is 0.75%. Less than 1% of our people have been diagnosed and only one has died from it. So we're taking all that into consideration into why and how we're opening. One of the things we want to do is minimize the risk that is there. And we're going to go through that a couple different ways. And for one thing, we should also realize that those who are coming here, those who are going to come to our service, are our people. It's not the general public. You know, you go into the post office, for instance, or you go into town, go to Costco, go to Walmart, go to feel like I've been living at Lowe's recently, and you're dealing with the regular general public. But this is our people. It's a much smaller pool, and therefore, we believe a much smaller risk. But still, in opening, we want to do it right. Uh, we are going to encourage you to wear your mask. You're going to see signs when you come in that ask you to wear your mask, not because we're bowing down to the government, because we have people in a high-risk category in this church, and you will make them feel more comfortable and therefore feel more loved if you have your mask on. So we're going to ask you to wear it. We want to be aware of social distancing. We want to take all those things into consideration. As a matter of fact, 
we uh, don't necessarily, if you're not comfortable, want you in an enclosed space. So we have developed some new outdoor seating. So we will have outdoor seating areas, several outdoor seating areas where you can enjoy the service out in the, the fresh air and the gentle breeze, if it is a gentle breeze. If the weather is somehow not appropriate, uh, there will be a limited amount of indoor seating. For some of the outdoor seating, you will need to bring lawn chairs. Uh, the temperature next week is supposed to be fairly high, but we should be out of here before that becomes a problem. So you can sit outdoors or a limited amount of seating indoors <laughs> for those who are uncomfortable outside or worried about the weather or anything like that. Uh, you can come back and you can sit in here. We are going to have some chairs removed, so we're going to have some social distancing. We're going to be taking all those things into consideration. So we, uh, we want you to come back. By the way, for some of the outdoor seating, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but uh, bring your lawn chairs because we have some seating as you saw in that section of the video but we're also going to have an area set aside where you can put your lawn chairs we'll be running audio and if we can make it work video of the service out in some of the areas outdoors uh, so that's an option but if you it wouldn't hurt to have your lawn chairs in the back of your uh, vehicle when you come so anyway that's the deal we are planning on opening next sunday september 6th for a service at 10 o'clock, just like the services we've been having uh, all along. We're going to take other precautions. Uh, we will not be handing out bulletins. We will not be passing an offering. We will be taking communion. But when you get here, there will be communion elements set up for you to take your own little prepackage, like we've been doing for the past few months, um, that have been put in there by people wearing gloves. So you will be the only one who have touched that at that point, and you can take that communion element, take it to your seat. When we get to that portion of the service, we'll take it together. So we're doing what we can to minimize the risk and do this properly, but we're doing it. And so we're looking forward to seeing as many of you as feel comfortable returning next week. If you don't feel comfortable, we will still be providing an online service at 10 o'clock. Uh, and have the sermon at least available during the week as well. So we want to make this to where everyone can access in a way that they're comfortable with. And uh, that, how that is is up to you. So thank you for watching this. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your instructions to us, for helping us to understand what is important in life, for knowing, Lord, that you are in charge of all things. And, and we say that sometimes, but this is where we actually show how much we mean it. Are you guarding us? Are you caring for us? And if we believe that's true, Lord, help us to have faith in that. Help us to overcome our fear and our concerns about some of the things that are going on. We ask your blessing on this church. We ask your blessing on our congregation. We ask your blessing on our leadership. And pray, Lord, that your spirit would operate in power through this church, in this community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week, one way or another.